It's all aboard for Swipe. We're at the London Boat Show. Here's what we've got for you in the next 10 minutes. Chris sets sail on virtual waters. I find out how the other half live when they're at sea. And we're going under the ocean in our games review. Welcome to Swipe. We heard there was a boat show in town this week and seeing as ocean going tech isn't something we get to experience often here in the city, we decided to come on down and investigate. Here's Chris. That's good. Knuckle to the sky. There we go. Sailing the seven seas, or at least pretending to. This simulator is designed to show you the ropes without you getting your feet wet. The idea is it's aimed for absolute beginners who know nothing about sailing, who've never done it before. You don't have to worry about water and other things such as the boom coming across. You can hop in and if you don't like it, you can hop it out again the next second. The boat heels like it would if there was actual wind. It's a lot more stable, so you're less likely to fall out. You can't capsize the boat, which is when it flips over. Um, so it's not completely the same, but it's very close. It's probably as close as you can get while staying on land. <laughs> This is just some of the tech at this year's London Boat Show. Other things on display include virtual simulators that let you practice your parking. Dealers can introduce people to the system without having to spend money on fuel and arranging skippers to take boats out. Or a specialised onboard sonar that claims to make fishing easier. Sonar uh, historically was uh, recorded information that would then you would pass over and it was in the history. Um, but what this does is actually gives you real-time views of live fish that are swimming under the boat. Um, so if something comes under you, you would like to see it coming in rather than going over and having to go back again and, and find it. Maritime gadgetry has even expanded into wearable tech. This wristband lets surfers control the size and shape of the wave that their boat creates. And competitive sailors are already using glasses that feed them real-time race data to help give them the edge. Other companies are making use of existing technology to improve your experience when out on the water. Like a crowdfunded wind meter that connects to a smartphone, giving you measurements through an app. All these tools might be fun if you love your tech. But ultimately, activities like sailing or fishing are all about using skill to conquer nature. And there's a feeling amongst some that this reliance on gadgets takes that element away from the experience. Chris Cregan, Sky News. This is the first time I've ever anchored Swipe from a boat show. It's also the first time I've ever used such a bad pun, and you can blame Chris for that. Now, time for a roundup of some of this week's tech news. Snapchat's main hub outside of the US is going to be the UK. The move by Snap, the owner of Snapchat, sets it apart from the likes of Apple, Google and Facebook that picked countries such as Ireland for a base in Europe where there are lower tax regimes. The US Defense Department said its testing of a swarm of self-healing micro-drones was successful. Just over 100 of the Perdix drones with a wingspan of 30 centimeters each were dropped from fighter jets over California in October. The mini UAVs communicate with each other and make decisions as a group. HTC announced two new handsets this week. The U Ultra and U Play use artificial intelligence to learn your phone habits. And Nokia is back in the phone gang. HMD Global unveiled its Android device carrying the brand. But the Nokia 6 is only launching in China. And while we're talking phones, this week marked 10 years since the late founder of Apple, Steve Jobs, first unveiled the iPhone. Since then, Apple has sold more than a billion of the handsets and become the world's most valuable company. I am Andrew Ryan. Stick around for our game slot. We've got our review as best ever water-themed adventures. But before that... This is a 6.6 .6 million pound yacht. So what does that money buy you? Well, funnily enough, I don't often get to hang out on expensive yachts, so we've got a guy to show us around. Come and meet Spencer. Hi, Gemma. Take us inside. Show well, us around. Welcome to the uh, splendid 95 yacht. Um, this is the biggest yacht on display at the uh, London Boat Show. The feeling of the yacht is very, very um, prestigious and luxurious. From the nice relaxing area here to the formal dining area, the galley over there to the left, and then forward to the splendid master cabin, which really, really stands above the rest. We're, we're moving into the um, lovely triplex master cabin. Uh, and then there's a central level for dressing. 
And what's well, down here? Right at the bottom there, you've got the um, splendid bathroom. So this is the cockpit. This is where the captain sits. Yes, this is where the action happens. This is from the, the switch gear you see in front. You can control everything from windscreen wipers to engines. Uh, the two large stalks you see there, that's the engine throttles. This boat has two engines. And to the right of that, there's a bow thruster and a stern thruster, which are smaller propellers which move the boat sideways. Uh, just to the left of that is a nice piece of tech. Um, that's a Zenta joystick. So using both engines and both thrusters, that controls the boat in a very easy manner. Uh, enables the boat to, to manoeuvre in harbours extremely well. That controls in all the whole conditions. boat? That controls both engines and both thrusters, yeah, right. exactly. Um, you'll see a splendid screen, which is our own management system. And if I just push a few buttons, you'll see a screen where you can uh, basically monitor the, um, the boat as a whole. OK, you can control generators, electrical systems. It shows your level of fluid, fluids, such as fuel and water on board at the same time. What kinds of technology specifically do you think are having the biggest impact on yachting right now? Realistic, whether it's the owner using the internet on board and using this as, a, as an office away from the office, or whether he wants to just monitor his boat when he's not on it, he can have a dial-up connection, have cameras on board and see what's going on. So internet connected products? Yes. Are we going to see driverless yachts at some point? I'm sure we will see that yeah. at some point. We're a fair way behind car technology, but by the same token, that is a possibility. What happens then if there's a big storm and something malfunctions? The boat has systems for redundancy, it has backup systems, and also the communication system today mean that the location of the boat is so closely monitored that it's easy to communicate the problem and also to get help to the boat. Video games time now, and because we knew we'd be at a boat show, we asked Gav, our reviewer, to pick his best ever water-themed titles. And here's what he came back with. One of my favourite games ever is Bioshock, and that you basically spend entirely underwater in this sort of weird city that's kind of something's gone wrong, you're not quite sure, but you can see you're basically surrounded by water and these sort of like leaky bits of the sea coming in all the time. And it puts a lot of pressure on obviously the outside, but you can feel that pressure on all the people in the city you realize that something has gone wrong. Not necessarily because it's under the sea, but because of other stuff and the way the city has been run by this sort of crazy guy. And you're not, never quite sure what's going on in Bioshock, and there's a huge twist, which is one of the best twists in video games. Um, so you should definitely play that. There's been a bunch of sequels to Bioshock, but for me, they've never really come close to how good the original was. Most of the Uncharted series takes place kind of at sea or you're on a boat or you're under the sea at some point. But in Uncharted 3, one of the best levels is the big shipwreck um, level. And basically, there's a bunch of sort of broken down ships you have to run around. And it feels like it goes on for ages because the level is so massive. And you spend a lot of it either sort of like jumping over old ships or jumping underwater to try and sort of bring somebody else into water. Um, you can do pretty much the entire level kind of like bobbing your head up and down, which is kind of what I like to do because you can sort of bob around, sort of see a naughty guy there, grab him by the leg and pull him into the water, which is really, really good and a good way of using it as well. Um, but it's also kind of scary because you've got these giant ships, which obviously ships aren't real and they don't have personalities or souls or anything like that. But they really feel like they do because they're just these giant imposing things. And Uncharted is obviously perfect for that because you can jump around the place and things like that. So even though you spend a lot of your time sort of trying to get out of the water, that's one of my favorite Uncharted levels. A lot of the water games that I've spoken about have been these things where they, the water is kind of like a bad thing. Abzu is this lovely game where basically the only thing you've got to do is explore and sort of go up to like these lovely creatures and you kind of make your own fun out of it. It's got an amazing soundtrack to sort of just in the background and you just have a really, really nice time under the sea where really you expect something bad to happen but nothing really bad happens so it's just a really really lovely game of being under the sea that takes all the frightening elements out of it and just makes it a really nice experience who needs to spend 6.6 .6 million on a yacht when you can get one of those for just a few hundred that's it for this week don't forget to follow us on twitter at sky News swipe to see what we get up to throughout the week and we'll see you again next time bye bye